Hello, welcome to my channel or welcome back to my channel where I talk about all things natural dyes and share natural dyes tutorials with you. I'm really looking forward to sharing today's tutorial with you. It's been one of the most requested I've had. I'm going to be showing you how to make lake pigments. My original plan was to make this a really simple beginner's tutorial, and this will be a tutorial that beginners can follow along with, but after opening a question box on Instagram and getting some really insightful advanced questions from you all, I decided I wanted to address some of those questions in this tutorial as well. So as we move through the tutorial, I will be including information that answers some of those questions as well. So before I jump into how to make a lake pigment, I wanted to touch in on what a lake pigment is and how it works. So a lake pigment is a way to turn a water soluble dye into a non soluble pigment. So this is a way to preserve color from your old dye pots or from fresh dye and to be able to use them for a multitude of applications that you wouldn't necessarily be able to use them for in their water soluble form. Lake pigment is made by taking a mordant, usually an aluminum mordant, and adding it to a dye bath where that mordant the minerals in the morning are going to bind on to the dye particles and they're going to stabilize them making them insoluble and there are actually quite a few reasons to turn a dye bath into a lake pigment one being it builds a whole new level of sustainability into your dye practice because you're not just throwing out old dye baths you're using them for something more another is that this is a way to preserve the color so in a dye bath eventually the dye chemicals are going to start to decompose and degrade eventually the dye bath will form mold some quicker than others and the dye bath will go bad but this is a way to preserve that color and to use it for a whole multitude of applications that it wouldn't be able to be used for in its water soluble dye form. So these shelf staple pigments can be used to make watercolors, crayons, pastels, and other types of paints. And they last on your shelf for a really long time. So you can keep them until you're able to use them for whatever application you choose to use them for. With all that being said, it's important to note that creating a lake pigment can take a couple of days. So just give yourself some time. It does take days to dry out into a powder. There's also an option to store it as a wet paste in, the, in your fridge and that will cut down on some of the process time. But if you're hoping to dry it out into a powder, this will be a multi-day process. So I want to address one of the questions I'm asked most frequently about lake pigments on Instagram. And that is about light fastness. So is there a way to make a lake pigment from a fugitive dye and then turn that lake pigment into a light fast pigment and the real answer is really no just as a mordant will give some properties of light fastness and wash fastness to a dye when it's being used on a textile well the same holds true for a lake pigment but we also know that a mordant cannot change a fugitive dye into a color fast dye so that also holds true for a lake pigment so if you're making a lake pigment from a fugitive dye it's not going to be very light fast so a couple things to consider if you do want to make a lake pigment from a fugitive dye is what application you're going to be using it for. So there are so many that you could probably find one that is okay for a more fugitive dye. For instance, kids crayons. If you wanted to make a box of crayons for kids using lake pigments, those don't necessarily need to be very light fast. Another consideration is how dark your dye is that you're making your lake pigment out of. So we know that a darker color with more dye particles is going to offer more protection against UV. So if you're wanting to use a more fugitive dye source to make a lake pigment, you can make a more concentrated dye. And then once it's made into whatever application you choose to make it into, you could layer it. Let's say if you're doing paints, you could layer more layers. That will help that pigment be a bit more light fast, but not much. So it's just something to keep in mind. Okay, so let's talk about what we're going to need to make a lake pigment. You're going to want a dye that has been extracted so it's in its liquid form without any of the plant material in it. So it's been strained and it's just the dye liquor left over. You're gonna want a sieve and a coffee filter or a paper towel. Uh, you could also use a cloth. I find that coffee filters are the easiest way to strain your light pigment and filter them. Something to catch the liquid, so a bowl, a bucket, something that is big enough to catch the liquid. You're going to need a mordant. I like to use alum. I'm going to loop back around to this and answer a question that's asked on Instagram frequently. And you're going to need an alkali. I'll be using soda ash. Something to measure your dye in. 
you can approximately measure. I'm also gonna loop back around to that. A spoon for stirring. If you're using a cold dye, you're gonna want something to pre-mix your mordant and your alkali in with some warm water, so a jar or a bowl and a spoon, something that won't be used for food again. A mask and gloves for safety. It's nice to have some cloths around just in case there's a spill. A scale, and it's really helpful to have some pH strips also, uh, or a pH tester of some sort. So it's not completely necessary, but if you're in a problem shooting phase and you're trying to figure out what's going on, pH strips will be really helpful. So to loop back around to the mordant, so you're going to need a mordant to bond onto the dye like we talked about earlier. The question I'm frequently asked about lake pigments on Instagram is how can you shift color? So one way to do this during the lake making process is to use a different mordant besides alum. So this could look like iron, so ferrous sulfate or ferrous acetate. It could also look like copper or tin. However, those are not as safe to use as aluminum or iron mordants. I often don't use copper and tin in my own dye practice because disposal is trickier and it's just not as safe as working with other mordants. But those are ways that you can shift the color of your dye during the lake process and have different color results. If you do decide to use copper or tin in your lake making process, I definitely recommend taking a deep dive into safety and figuring out the best way for disposal and also only using as much of those mordants as you need to shift the color and not using excess. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about how to know how much mordant you need to use but those will work for some color shifts. So you might be wondering why we can't use pH to shift the color. And that's because we have to add an acid, which would be our mordant, but then we also have to add the alkaline. So the color might shift when you add the acid, but when we add the alkaline, it's going to shift back to its true color. And the goal is for the dye to be a neutral pH. So you're gonna find that the color is pretty true to itself once the lake has been made. And while we're on the subject of color and modifying the color of lake pigments, we can also use an alkali that will modify and more, add more opacity to your pigment. So a great option for this is chalk. You could use chalk as your alkali. That's going to add a lot of body and a lot of opacity to your color, and you're going to get a more pastel color, so it's like stretching the color out. What the dye particles are actually binding to from the alum mordant is the aluminum hydroxide, which is translucent and clear. So if you really want to add some more pastel opacity to your dye pigments, using chalk as your alkali is a really great option. And, and there are some other ways to add opacity to your dye pigments that I will list in the description box below. Okay, so our first step now to actually making our lake pigments is going to be trying to determine how much dye we're working with. I'm gonna be working with this Sulfur Cosmo dye and you can see it's very a small, a very small amount. I have already used this dye. So it's not exhausted, but it's also not as potent as it was when I first used it to dye fabric. So I'm going to measure it out here in this beaker to see just how much I'm working with. So I'm gonna be working with about three tenths of a liter of this dye. Almost exactly. So the most common recipe that you will see calls for 10 grams of alum per liter of dye, and that's for an exhausted dye, so a diluted dye. So it's not exact, and it would then call for five grams of soda ash or your alkali per liter of dye. The amount of alum that we need is really gonna depend on how strong your dye bath is. And this is gonna vary depending on what dye you're using, how much the dye was used before you're making the dye bath, etc. So you could start using a smaller amount of alum and see how the precipitation is. See if it's binding, see how clear the supernatant is, which is the liquid that's gonna exist above the pigment when the pigment begins to settle. So you, so you want that to be translucent. You might have some color in it, but you want to see that the dye particles are sinking to the bottom and precipitating away from the supernatant. And so if you are using the method of adding less alum in the beginning and looking at your supernatant and trying to figure out if you've added enough, you can test your pH and see if it's neutral. Of course, if your pigment isn't precipitating, then you can add just a little bit more at a time, adding little bits by little bits. And this is going to be the best way 
for you to get that concentrated rich lake pigment. That being said, sometimes you will use a recipe, like let's say you use the 10 grams of alum per liter of dye and it's still not working and you still need to problem solve a little bit. So the first step is going to be checking the pH. And so if it's acidic, you're gonna to wanna to add more of your alkali. If it's alkali, you're gonna to wanna to more, add more of your acid and doing it that way as well. So there might be some problem solving that comes along with making lakes, but usually it works pretty well and pretty easily. And the 10 grams of alum and the 10 grams of acid and the five grams of alkali is a really great starting place. If you're just starting making lake pigments, then you just want an easy, straightforward method to use. So because I'm working with three tenths of a liter, I'm only going to be using three grams of alum. Whereas if I were working with a full liter, I would be using the whole 10 grams of alum. So I'm going to fill my cup just about less than halfway up with some hot water so I can dissolve my alum before pouring it into my cold dye. Okay, and now I'm gonna go ahead and measure out my alum. I'm gonna put a mask on. It's always a good idea to wear a mask when you're working with fine powders. Even though alum isn't a super fine powder, it's just best practice for safety to wear a mask. Anyways, you don't wanna breathe it in. Okay, and now just stir until it's completely dissolved. Now my alum is the potassium aluminum sulfate, which is the naturally occurring alum, but you could also use aluminum sulfate, which is not the naturally occurring. It's made in a lab type alum, but it should work just the same for lake pigments. Okay, so I've got a nice, clear, fully dissolved solution here, and I'm just gonna pour it right into my dye. So for this tutorial, I'm just going with the recipe because I wanna show exactly what happens when you use the 10 grams per liter of dye. Okay, so I just pour it right in. Maybe. And then give it a stir. You should almost immediately see the mordant bond onto the dye particles and you'll be able to see them floating in the solution. I tried to bring it over and show the camera, but it's really hard to see in this light. So I'll have to just show you after we add the soda ash. So I'm going to pre-dissolve my soda ash just the same way that I pre-dissolved my alum. And so an easy way to do this math if you have a wonky measurement like I did is, is that the recipe calls for half the amount of alkali as acid. So since I knew it was easy to figure out the three grams of my alum, I know I'll just be using 1.5 grams of soda ash. So I'm stir it as well as you can until it's fully dissolved. And now for this part, you're really gonna to wanna to make sure you have a large enough vessel to allow for quite a bit of bubbling. So when the soda ash goes into the solution, it's going to neutralize it, which causes a lot of effervescence to happen. So that's just a lot of foaming and bubbling. Uh, you can stir the whole time you pour the soda ash, which will help minimize some of that, but it's still going to rise up and bubble quite a bit. So you just wanna make sure that you're not gonna have a volcano and uh, make sure you have enough space here for that effervescence to occur. So you can see how some opacity has formed now and that's what you want to see. It means it's working, but interestingly enough, I'm not sure if it's just the color or if it's off somehow, but you might get to see me troubleshoot a little bit in this tutorial because I'm not seeing what I normally see in my lake pigments, where I can see the definite bond between the dye and the mordant. So I'm gonna test the pH and see where we're at. 
pH is off. So I'm looking at my test strip now and let me see if I can show you this. It's looking like a five. I'm wanting it to be seven. So that means I need to add some more alkali and try to get it neutral and then see what it does then. So this is fun. I'm really glad this is happening during this tutorial because this is all part of the process. Testing the pH and trying to troubleshoot and figure out what's going on is fun and it's part of the process and we'll see what happens. So my pH being off and being acidic tells me that my dye to start with might have been a little bit more acidic. So I didn't test it to start and I don't normally test it um, because it's going to be a little troubleshooting anyways if your dye is acidic because there's no exact recipe for how much more alkali to add if your dye is a bit acidic. You just have to add a bit more at a time until you get it to the place you want it to be. All right, so I'm gonna add this in. I'm gonna add a little bit and then I'll test the pH again and see where we are. So we're looking a lot closer to neutral now. I'd say it looks almost perfect. So I'm gonna let it sit for a bit and see if I see that precipitation begin to happen. And if not, then we'll come back and troubleshoot some more. The amount of time it takes for the precipitation to take place really depends on how much you're working with. And it's actually, actually varied for me going from dye to dye. So a few in a few hours, or really an hour, you should start seeing a little bit of separation happen where, you, where you're seeing that supernatant and the pigment. So the supernatant is gonna have everything that we don't really want in our pigment. It's gonna have the excess minerals and the water and any dye that didn't bind on to the mordant. And I will also show you what they look like in the different stages. But before showing you those examples, I just wanna finish explaining what the process of making this lake looks like. So once this separates, and you see that definite separation, you're gonna pour off the supernatant. And then you're going to strain the pigment through the coffee filter and seed. And once that all the liquid is strained out, you'll have this really gelatinous pudding like texture left over. At that point, you're going to want to wash your pigment. You're going to take that gel and you're going to put it back into either the same container that you used previously or another container. some distilled water or you can use your tap water if it's not heavy in minerals over it and let it sit for a couple of hours. And that's going to dissolve all the excess minerals and things that you don't want to be in your pigment. If you skip this step, you'll see that you have these crystal-like -like formations happening on your lake, and that could really potentially mess up your pigment and make it to where you can't use it for some of the applications we talked about before. And this is called washing your lake. And so once you let it sit in the water for a couple of hours, you're gonna strain it again through a filter and a new coffee filter or paper towel or whatever you're choosing to use. And you're gonna be left again with that same gelatinous pigment. And so at this point, you have the option of either storing your pigment as a wet paste in your fridge. It will last longer in this form if you add a few drops of antimicrobial essential oil to it and keep it in an airtight container. 
and this can be used for direct application or you can also turn lake pigment back into what's called split lake dyes that can be used to dye protein fibers such as wool or you can then just let it dry out so I'm going to show you what that looks like as well. So I have here a kutch lake pigment that has been filtered and then it has been washed and now it's been filtered again and now it's in this gelatinous pudding like consistency. And then I also have three leg pigments that I've been drying for various amounts of time that I'm gonna show you right now so you can kind of see what they look like as they're drying out and you can know what to expect. So these are not completely dry yet, but they're on their way and they'll be dry within a couple of days. So this is a weld pigment that's been drying for a couple of days and it's really on its way to becoming dry, but still a bit wet. Here we have acorn. It's been drying for almost the same amount of time. But there was a bit more pigment here. And this is a red onion dye that's been dying for, drying for about one day less. And so you can kind of see what the color is going to be like when it's ground and dry, as it starts to dry on the side of the filter. This weld pigment is going to be a really light white, whitish yellow that I'll be able to mix with other pigments to add a bit more opacity. And now I'm going to show you some that I've made previously that are already dried, some that I've already ground into a powder, and some that I still need to grind into a powder. So this is a matter late. So here's goldenrod. This is Black Knight Scabiosa. It's hard to pick this Black Knight color up, but it's actually like a very deep blue. And this is Avocado Pits. This is a very exhausted dye bath. And so this is a great example of a dye bath where I could have added a lot less alum to spread the color less, but this is actually a really pretty pastel color that I really like, and it will be a fun one to mix with other more saturated colors to create a whole color palette. I have many more, but those are just some examples I wanted to show you so you can see what they look like when they're dry, and then you can just store them this way, and they last for a long time. Um, they're completely shelf stable, so unless they're indirect UV light, they should last and their color should be preserved for a long time. Okay, so back to our Sulfur Cosmo lake that we were working with and that I was troubleshooting. It looks like it's working. So I'm going to show you. It's only been about 30 minutes, but you're going to be able to see a little layer of separation taking place. So you can see that little layer of the more yellow clear liquid is that precipitation beginning to take place. Here we are after about two hours. So thank you so much for being here. I hope that I answered some of your questions about making lake pigments and that you found this tutorial helpful. If you have any more questions, please feel free to drop them in the comments below or you can hop on over to my Instagram where you can also reach me and I'm always happy to chat there as well. I hope that you all have an awesome day.